Let me get started then, ladies and gentlemen. I was just saying that um, you know these. I'm going to read out prepared statements in a second, and so often when I do these things, especially in finance, corporate governance type occasions, I worry that the ladies part of the address is completely redundant, and I'm delighted to see that that's not the case today. So, ladies and gentlemen. Um, on your program, I understand that it says Jörg Rochol will be doing the introduction here. As you can see, I'm not Jörg Rochol. Um, my name is Raji Jayaraman. I'm a professor of economics here at ESMT Berlin, um, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you on behalf of Jörg to this year's European Corporate Governance Institute annual members meeting. Um, Jörg unfortunately couldn't be here today. Uh, he sends his apologies, but he'll be joining you for dinner later on when he flies in. So um, he certainly looks forward to that. And again, conveys his apologies for his absence. Um, before you get started today, I just wanted to tell you a few words about um, our school, especially for those of you who are here for the first time. Um, ESMT was founded in 2002 by 25 leading global companies and institutions to provide a truly international um, business school in Germany. We offer MBA, executive MBA, masters in management and executive education programs for participants that come from all over the world. Um, in addition to being an economist here, I'm also the faculty lead of the MBA program. And just to give you an idea of how international our program is, this year's MBA class um, of around 70 students uh, has 90% non-German nationals from 40 different countries. So it's, it's a truly international program program. Uh, this building, as you may or may not know, originally housed the GDR um, State Council building, the Staatsratsgebäude. Um, and I've really had to revise my negative stereotype of 60s architecture since having the pleasure of working in this building. And I hope if you enough of you lobby for it, um, you can get a tour of the building later on because it's really worth seeing if you haven't seen it before. ESMT was established here in 2006, and this room in which uh, you're sitting used to be the Diplomats Hall. So Diplomats were accredited in this room, and the neighboring room between um, the fall of the wall and the time ESMT moved in here, uh, this is where the first uh, chancellery was. So Gerhard Schröder's cabinet sat in the next room. Um, over there for, for a few years before the Kanzleramt was built. So it's a truly, it's a historic building that's well worth, um, well worth seeing. So this room in here, for instance, you'll notice as you go through the rooms, each room is constructed differently in this room over here for all possible, you know, for whatever reason was built for its acoustics. And you notice the paneling, the waves and the paneling in every room has a different structure. So take a look, it's really, it's a beautiful building. Um, as an international scientific nonprofit association, um, ECGI provides a platform for debate and dialogue around relevant corporate governance issues, and this fits in quite neatly with ESMT's mission as well, to create and impart new knowledge um, to advance business and society. Similar to ESMT, the purpose of ECGI is to carry out commission and distribute research, in this case on corporate governance. Um, I wish you every success in these endeavors over the next couple days on campus. Let me leave it at that. And now please uh, join me to extend a warm welcome to Professor Marco Becht, not Brecht, I was told, um, board member of ECGI, Professor Becht. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We're delighted to be here at ESMT. Uh, it's fantastic, uh, your great hosts. We're also grateful to Jörg Rochol, who's one of our research members. Now, um, ECGI is a global network of researchers. We have 200 research members now from all over the world in law, finance, and economics. And the mission is uh, leading research with global impact. So uh, bring the research out there uh, to have it discussed. And our annual members meeting is an example of that. We have chosen uh, three topics. Uh, that are of current interest to which researchers have something to contribute. So we start off with common ownership. That's the first session we have now. Uh, we will then move to debate uh, the European Union's thinking and suggestion that uh, takeovers from outside the EU might be or should be controlled. And we'll have a debate on this because people have views on either side. And tomorrow we'll talk about uh, big data and the challenge that poses for boards. Um, so without much ado, we move to the first session on common ownership. 
And we are extremely fortunate to have with us uh, a very distinguished panel. We first of all have Barbara Novick, uh, who is a vice chairman of uh, BlackRock, uh, and she is responsible for BlackRock's um, uh, stewardship program uh, worldwide. Now, BlackRock are, of course, an extremely large investor, uh, having been very successful. So uh, BlackRock have a great responsibility towards uh, their own clients and investors, but also towards society. We are really grateful to Barbara for having come to New York to be with us. Uh, we have next to her uh, Greg Metcraft, who is at the OECD. Uh, he's a director there. And uh, we are really grateful for him to have come because uh, the first session is called uh, Corporate Governance Meet, uh, Meets Antitrust, uh, where uh, corporate governance and issues of competition policy come together, uh, which doesn't normally happen. Um, we discuss those in isolation, but here they join. And Greg happens to be responsible for both corporate governance and competition at the OECD, so he's ideally placed. And finally, we have uh, here to my right, Xavi Vives, who is one of the leading uh, scholars on competition policy in Europe. He's been doing this for many years. And he also happens to be somebody who's one of our research members because he has a history in corporate governance. And we're very grateful uh, to him. Now, um, to just close the uh, introduction on this, on a slightly sentimental note, our founding chairman of ECGI was Antonio Borges, uh, the, the late Antonio Borges, who was the dean of INSEAD. Um, and uh, after his uh, death, the Republic of Portugal endowed a chair uh, at INSEAD, and Antonio really wanted Xavier to have that chair. Uh, so he liked Xavier very much, and he great, paid great attention to the subject of antitrust. We had Mario Monti talk about it. So this is also a tribute to Antonio, who many of you knew and we liked very much. So thank you, for Xavier, for having accepted to come, and we look very much forward uh, to your intervention, which you promised to keep to 30 minutes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for the very kind introduction and reference to, uh, uh, to Antonio, uh, a great loss. Um, uh, just uh, full disclosure, I, uh, uh, Marco told me that I should keep it to 30 minutes just three minutes ago. <laughs> so I was planning to have it for 45 minutes, so just I'll, I'll do my best. Um, okay. Um, so let me start uh, uh, by showing uh, you this... Um, uh, this chart, uh, which is a web, uh, basically, of uh, cross-ownership links and common ownership links by uh, investors uh, in car booking companies, uh, Uber, uh, Lyft, uh, Didi, uh, Grab, Ola, etc. Um, so, as you see, there are quite a bit, and they are increasing. So, for example, recently, Uber uh, got a 20% uh, or intends to have a 20% uh, in, uh, in Grab. And some, uh, for example, Uber and Lyft has uh, common investors, uh, AF Square and Fidelity. The question, and one of the questions that we're going to talk about, I guess, is whether we should worry about competition in this uh, sector because of this uh, increasing uh, web of cross and common ownership or not. And this is just um, uh, one example. Uh, this is the outline of the talk I wanted to give. Uh, so it will be shorter. Uh, so I wanted to illustrate a little bit uh, why I think we have this concern. And this concern comes from a previous concern, which is that oligopoly is on the rise in general, in, in, in many markets. And I think the concern is that the, um, some of these uh, cross links may um, accentuate some of the issues that we know or some of the inefficiencies uh, that come with oligopoly. Uh, so I, I will go very fast on some of the uh, topics also which are, uh, I think, known on the increase and consolidation of institutional investment, common ownership, some highlights on, the, on corporate uh, governance. And basically, I will pose the question, which I think is a very classical question in industrial organization, uh, whether these um, uh, links uh, lead to market power in markets, or uh, if they have an efficiency uh, effect or an efficiency uh, consideration. And I will end with some of the antitrust concerns uh, as required. So, um, the increase uh, and the, the idea that oligopoly is widespread 
uh, comes uh, because we see a growing uh, product market concentration and market power in the uh, last decades, increases in economic profits and markups in many uh, economies. I'll, I will show some US uh, data. And also uh, some issues which uh, ring uh, distributional, uh, if you want, uh, slant, which is uh, the declining labor share and um, instances of oligopoly in, um, in, um, in labor markets. All this uh, goes together with a certain perception, at least this was the case under the Obama administration, I am not sure what's the perception now under the Trump administration, uh, of a lack of dynamism in terms of entry and exit, investment and innovation on both sides of the Atlantic. Okay? And also, after the Great Recession and the sluggish recovery, some people have blamed, like Sommer, Stiglitz, Krugman, etc., have blamed it on uh, increased market power, or potentially on increased market power. Um, just uh, uh, this, I'll, I'll, I'll fly over, over this. Uh, these are just slides which show the trend of increasing product market concentration in several um, industries uh, in the US. Um, uh, how uh, this has been accompanied by an increase in markups, in particular uh, from uh, the 1980s, and also uh, be it uh, dividends or uh, market value. Um, of firms and how the labor share uh, has declined and uh, local labor market concentration has increased. For example, so Walmart has uh, market power, has oligopsony or monopsony power in its local labor markets. Together with this, which is this is just the background, uh, there, there has been this rise in overlapping ownership. Uh, the world of dispersed ownership um, no longer applies. Um, asset management industry has grown uh, very much. Uh, diversified passive funds uh, play an increasing important uh, role, and also the asset management industry has become more concentrated. This has led also to an increase in common ownership patterns in the same industry, which is uh, why I guess we are uh, here uh, today. Together with this, in some industries, like in the uh, Uber, Lyft uh, markets, uh, some cross-ownership shareholdings are also uh, widespread. Uh, here, for example, um, uh, there's a slide in which uh, it is shown how um, the um, average share of institutional ownership uh, since the 80s has grown quite a bit, and how the proportion of uh, what here is termed quasi-indexers, that's to say, basically passive funds, uh, has taken the, the lion's share of this uh, increase. Uh, when we go uh, down to uh, industries, uh, then several researches, basically, uh, which this uh, was started by Athar, uh, Martin Smalls, which in fact is the audience, and, uh, and others, uh, have pointed out that if you look at the top owners uh, in several key industries, like banks, airlines, and others, typically you uh, see the same suspects with some uh, variations, okay? So which are large funds sometimes, large diversified funds, and sometimes it's more specialized funds. In airlines, there are also some uh, more specialized funds. And this contrasts with more, uh, what we could say, uh, firms which are more controlled uh, by a single shareholder, like, I don't know, Amazon, for example. Okay, so this leads us to a basic, very basic issue, which is a, a very basic issue in economics, corporate finance, uh, uh, and finance, uh, which is what is the objective of the firm? It turns out, so the, the bottom line basically is that if markets are competitive, the objective of the firm is kind of uncontroversial. Firms just should maximize their profits, the value of the firm, that's it. Uh, and this means that there is no market power, neither in product or labor markets. However, if not, uh, then this ceases to be the case because then uh, um, the, um, the managers may take into account uh, the interactions uh, with other firms, the interests of the shareholders that hold a diversified portfolio and therefore uh, may be heard sometimes, for example, uh, with tougher competition. And this has uh, uh, led to the literature to uh, an assumption, which has been justified in several ways, that a manager of a firm maximizes a weighted average of shareholders' utility. So in, this is the idea, the basic idea here is that the manager of the firm have to um, uh, really uh, take into account the interests of shareholders, but the interests of shareholders, uh, which, for example, are 
very invested in a certain sector, and mostly have concentrated in this sector, well, well may be uh, to take into account also the profits of the rivals. Okay, and so this uh, implicit internalization uh, may be uh, taken into account uh, like this, and there are several models uh, that try to uh, microfound this from voting, power indices, etc. This goes back to uh, also to Chicago with um, some of the theories of Pelsman, where management uh, maximizes support from shareholders. Okay, uh, now a very simple model of um, of how this works in a symmetric situation is just thinking that a, uh, a firm maximizes, uh, the manager of a firm internalizing the interest of uh, diversified shareholders in an industry, so let, let's think just uh, one sector economy or one industry, uh, will put some weight on the profits of rivals. And this will depend on the links, on the type of links that there are in this industry, be it common or cross ownership. It will be different, this lambda, which in fact is what Edgeworth called the coefficient uh, of effective sympathy, okay? Edgeworth is one of the fathers of oligopoly theory. Um, uh, this may be uh, linked to whether these links are uh, silent, in terms of their silent financial interest with no control, or they have some degree of control um, in, in different uh, uh, versions. So here, what's important to realize is that the same stake in a firm may have very different if you want lambda or internalization consequences depending on the type of link. Okay, some links will lead to very low lambda, some links may lead to uh, much higher lambdas. So typically also what we find is that this internalization of the profits of others, or other rivals, tends to be increasing in the share of passive investors because uh, they are typically more diversified, also uh, increasing in their degree of control. If they had zero control, the lambda would be zero. So if you think that it has zero control, the lambda would be zero. The degree of concentration of these passive investors and also in the active investors holding in other firms, we typically have more control. Okay, so the impact on this internalization will be higher. Okay, so uh, le let me just show you some, uh, th this slide is some work we are doing with uh, co-authors, uh, Albert Banal and Joe Selderslacks. Um, which is still is not finished, and so uh, there is no paper yet, but where we try to link the lambdas, what would be the active investors and the passive investors, and what we see is that at least around the crisis, the increase, the potential increase in this internalization of the profits of others comes basically from uh, the passive investors, the, the increase uh, in the passive investors. Um, and this happens uh, basically because these guys are more diversified and have become more concentrated. Okay, uh, what about uh, more explicitly uh, the governance? Um, so here, uh, what uh, strand of the literature uh, states is that common owners in an industry may have the ability and the incentive to influence management, and this comes basically from the basic idea I have uh, mentioned before, uh, just that um, the managers have to respond to the interests of the shareholders, and if the interest of the shareholder is not to purely uh, maximize the profit of the, of the firms, but takes into account a broader considerations, the, uh, the managers will take this into account. Okay, that's to cut short, uh, many different versions. All this happens modulo agency problems, which may go sometimes in the same direction, in terms of disinternalization, or sometimes against. Okay, so there are trade-offs uh, here, which I don't have time to, um, uh, to explain, so may maybe we can discuss uh, later on. In any case, what I think the literature has made clear is that a passive investment strategy does not mean a passive owner because a passive owners, uh, sorry, because passive, a passive investment strategy still, uh, be it an index fund or something similar, has voice and can modify incentives and also can vote. Okay? What typically they cannot do is exit. Okay? So this discipline device does not exist, but the others uh, do exist. Some uh, literature also points out that industries with more common ownership have less relative performance manager compensation, indicating a certain degree of disinternalization, and also that voting uh, is effective in terms of the, um, influencing management in terms of their career uh, concerns, so that therefore that managers do pay attention uh, to big uh, stakeholders that can wield the power of their vote. 
Okay, so let me just uh, go, um, uh, and sorry to be a little bit rushed, but this is Marco's fault. Um, um, the, um, uh, to the basic uh, point of whether all this is for the good, in a sense, okay, all this has an efficiency explanation, or whether there we should be concerned uh, in terms of um, in, uh, economic inefficiencies related to market power, okay, to related basically to relaxing competition. So the two, the basic question is: Does this increase in uh, web uh, links uh, in terms of ownership, common cross, etc., aggravates the potential oligopoly market power problem? Let's see. And if so, whether there is an efficiency defense, if you want a little bit in the antitrust um, uh, language or lingo. So here I have to go back to the 60s. So in the 60s, there was a basic paradigm, which was the structure conduct performance paradigm in industrial organization, in which there was the market power hypothesis, which it said, firms in concentrated markets protected by barriers to entry earn high price cost margins and profits. And there was some weak statistical evidence to corroborate uh, that. To this, the Chicago School said, well, all this can be explained in another way, which is basically large firms are more efficient, command larger price cost margins, and earn higher profits. And therefore, uh, concentration and industry profitability go together, not because of market power, it's just because of efficiency. Okay? Now, uh, I think we are in a similar debate. Okay, so now we, we are in a parallel debate, and this parallel debate um, has modified the Herfindahl index, which is the typical uh, concentration index, uh, an, an index of market power, if you want, because it's related to the average margin in, in an industry uh, in, in the antitrust analysis or in the competition analysis, with the, a modified Herfindahl index. What's the modified Herfindahl index? Is a Herfindahl index augmented with a delta, if you want, and this delta is due uh, to the common or cross ownership interest that may uh, relax competition a little bit more. This is related to the lambda internalization that I've uh, mentioned before, and the market shares of the firms that are linked. So if those uh, firms that are linked are very small, this, uh, I'm sure, uh, will have very little effect. If they are big, it would, ha it would have a much higher effect. Okay, so now, if uh, we uh, look at these modified Herfindahl uh, index indices, modified concentration indices, um, what we find is that in several sectors, here I just put the airlines and, uh, and banks, we see that the Herfindals have increased, but the modified Herfindals have increased much more, in particular since the mid-2000s, uh, okay? Have increased uh, much more. This uh, is uh, airlines, uh, this uh, is for banks and at county level, which are more the relevant, uh, the relevant markets, okay? So this one, in fact, is a, a, general, a further generalized Herfindahl index, which takes into account uh, cross-ownership, and common ownership. So it takes into account the different types of links. Let me just state uh, right here that I think the modified Herfindahl index is a useful tool, uh, but that we have to be careful with its use, and in particular, how it's uh, constructed. So how do you get to the lambdas? Because this depends very much on the degree of control, not only on the shares, the, the cash flow rights, but also on the control rights of the different shareholders. And to model this is not this easy, okay? So this we have to be careful. Okay, so that's the question. Does overlapping uh, ownership augment the effect of relevant market concentration on prices and fees uh, for customers? Um, a first uh, pass in aggregate terms is given by this figure, uh, which relates the learner index, which is a typical uh, markup measure uh, in, in, uh, in industries. This is average across industries in, in the US. And uh, an average also of this modified Herfindahl index. And we see that they correlate in the sense that when this modified Herfindahl index uh, increases, the learning index bounces a lot, is much more volatile, but the, the trend seems clear. Note that here, this is an association, so uh, this does not mean 
anything in terms of causality, among other things, because the modified Herfindel index is itself endogenous. So it's endogenous to the whole market structure. But it's a first indication that we may want to have a look at, uh, at this issue. So then some people have had a look, and now we can revise what we could tell the market power hypothesis. The market power hypothesis revised would be firms in markets with high levels of common overlapping ownership earn high price cost margins and profits. Okay? And maybe with already with an underlying concentrated uh, market. And then some of evidence which is consistent with uh, this uh, revived structure counter performance, if you want, uh, a result is in the US uh, for the airlines, which is the much debated uh, study by Athar, Smalls, and uh, co authors, and also on uh, another one on banking. There is a big debate, uh, obviously, on, on, on this, um, on the empirical methodology, whether there are holes in the analysis or not. Um, so, my view is that most likely there is something there. The airline paper. Um, has been, um, uh, it's forthcoming, I understand, in the Journal of Finance, which has higher standards, so uh, this uh, is um, uh, a point to take into account. But um, obviously, uh, scientific progress goes um, by proving and disproving things. So this, I think, uh, from my end still, uh, this is an open, um, an open question. Also, there is softer evidence in terms of a cross-section of industries, like the one I presented before, and then some of, our, of the work we have been doing also would be consistent with that, but these are more associations, more than causal uh, relationships. Also, there is another macro evidence uh, by Gutierrez and Philippon, uh, which they tend to find underinvestment uh, uh, in, in the US relative to standard valuation measures, and in particular driven uh, by this uh, passive uh, investment in, um, in, um, in industries with high concentration and high common uh, ownership. Again, these, I would say, are more associations than causal effects. Okay? Uh, for example, in, in, our, uh, in our work, uh, which is uh, not uh, public yet, we, uh, we do find the association that the delta that you uh, associate with the increase in the Herfindel due to these uh, common ownership patterns, the increase in this delta uh, lately typically has to be associated with passive investment more than with the active uh, in, uh, in investors. Okay? And the reason uh, is that there has been this shift from active to passive. Passive are more uh, uh, diversified and the passive become more concentrated. Okay. Now let's go to the, to the other side, okay? So let's take what before was the Chicago view. Now I'm not sure, okay? So, um, so the efficiency hypothesis uh, revised says, high levels of common ownership and efficiency are associated because common ownership improves all kinds of things. Information sharing among firms, internalization of horizontal and vertical external effects, firm collaboration, corporate governance because of economies of scale in, infor in information production and monitoring, and in fact induces managers to improve performance. Okay? So in this case, you would have large firms have more common ownership links, among other things because they are large, better corporate governance, are more efficient, and therefore they command a large price cost margin. So the idea here always is that more efficient firms have lower cost, but the price is uh, dictated by the least efficient firm. Okay? And so therefore, uh, this margin is earned by more efficient firms. And there is some evidence which, is, at least I would say, is not um, inconsistent uh, with, this, uh, with this view. Um, for example, by He and Huang, this on US cross-held uh, public firms, 98 to 2010, have higher uh, market share growth and profitability, okay? And certain uh, improvement in uh, enhanced productivity. Most of the empirical uh, work, though, I must say, I don't think it's a structural. So it's not really based on a specific model of an industry. And so this tells me that also that there will be much further work here to do, okay? So including the uh, Hian Wang. Huh? Okay, so... Uh, let me move on uh, to, um, uh, to a couple uh, of, um, 
of papers, if you want, of work in which I have participated, and in which point also are on the uh, potential efficiency side uh, of the debate. Uh, the first is the following, um, it re and it relates to technological spillovers. So technological spillovers are uh, quite important, and so the best work to date uh, it says that uh, uh, this is a cause of underinvestment in R&D. Socially optimal level of uh, R&D uh, tends to be between two and three times as high as the level observed because of these non-internalized technological spillovers. Now, obviously, one idea is that if um, uh, firms have a certain degree of common ownership, they will, this will be an incentive to internalize uh, this uh, these technological spillovers, and this may be a force for uh, efficiency, let's say. Okay? And so, uh, what we see in a classical, if you want, uh, oligopoly uh, model is that when the beta here in this graph, uh, the beta here is the, denotes the extent of spillovers, when the beta is very high, then increasing the lambda, which means this internalization, Whatever it means, you get this increase in lambda, increases both Q, which is output, and X, which is R&D effort. Okay, so it's a pro-competitive force. While if the spillovers are low, uh, we have the traditional case, which is uh, anti-competitive. All this is an, an industry analysis, okay, just in one industry. And in between, you have a mixed re uh, result where increasing lambda increases output, sorry, decreases output uh, and increases prices, but would increase R&D effort. So if this then you take a welfare perspective um, and you think what would be then the welfare optimal lambda, okay, the welfare optimal degree of this cross or overlapping ownership. And this depends uh, really on the basics of the market, uh, but the, the general picture uh, also in relation to uh, the beta here, which is the degree of spillovers, is that when these spillovers are high, uh, you want positive lambdas. When spillovers are low, you want zero lambdas. The TS means the lambda from the point of view of what we call total surplus in the industry, which is consumer surplus plus firm's profits, and uh, CS denotes just consumer surplus. So for intermediate level of spillovers, just in terms of consumer surplus, you would not like, but for uh, total surplus uh, reasons, uh, you would like it. These thresholds uh, typically depend on, con on concentration, and then in more concentrated markets, what happens is that the region where to increase lambda is good, it's reduced, okay? And so here we see a certain connection between the underlying oligopoly structure and the effect of common ownership, the potential effect of common ownership, because here is a very much reduced form uh, lambda, which may come from cross ownership, uh, this need not come from passive funds, whatever. So this is just whatever makes uh, managers internalize the profits of others, okay? Now, uh, let me uh, give you a, a preview uh, of a paper which is still is not um, uh, public either, but this will be public very, very soon uh, with uh, Jose Azar, who is also a um, colleague at ESE. And here, what, what we do is we, um, uh, we work a macroeconomic framework and we look for general equilibrium effects uh, of common ownership, still assuming that firms maximize a, a share-weighted average of shareholder utilities. Uh, we divide the society in owners and workers, so this is very simplified, all are consumers. And then when we, what we find is the following. When we have a one-sector economy, uh, then basically an increase in effective market concentration, which would be the modified Herfindels, tends to uh, agree with all the, um, the general features we've seen at the beginning in terms of leads to depressed employment, uh, real wages, and labor share. Okay, so it's consistent. Uh, uh, it's consistent with, what, uh, with the features that we had uh, first. And then also we find that controlling common ownership and reducing concentration will be complements in fostering employment. However, when we move to multiple sectors, then things are more complicated because we have uh, more effects. And in fact, more common ownership can be pro-competitive uh, due to intersector, horizontal, and vertical uh, pecuniary externalities. So basically, here we have three types of effects. We have two horizontal effects of common ownership. One, which is the intra-industry, which would be anti-competitive. And this is the one that we have been talking, basically. 
Another effect is inter-industry, and this is potentially ambiguous because it, it typically, in terms of the effect on the labor market, is anti-competitive, but the effect on product markets is typically pro-competitive. So when one sector, one firm in one sector, one large firm in one sector expands, uh, then this lowers prices and benefits other sectors and increase consumption. So there is a, a positive pecuniary externality uh, for the other uh, sectors. So then what we find is that when the level of common ownership is uniform in the economy, the overall effect is pro-competitive or anti-competitive depending on the relative levels of market power in the labor market and in the product markets. When market power in the labor market is low and market power in the product market is high, it tends to be pro-competitive. Okay? So, so this is one potential pro-competitive effect uh, of uh, this inter profit, uh, rivals profits internalization. And also typically if we had vertical links, this, because they tend to eliminate double marginalization, this in prima facie, they would be uh, competitive unless there are uh, some exclusionary uh, practices. We do not deal with this, I just leave this uh, here. Okay, I uh, end up uh, with some uh, antitrust concerns to keep uh, time. Um, so, as we see, there is growing interest in assessing the um, competitive effects of these overlapping ownership uh, arrangements. Uh, this is because of this rapid growth of common ownership stakes in competing firms. Also because the growth of private equity investment in firms holding partial ownership interest in competing firms in sectors. Okay? And some also, in terms of cross-ownership, some notorious cross-ownership uh, cases. There was one episode in uh, Ryanair's acquisition of Erlingus, the attempt, in fact, uh, uh, stock in, the, in Europe. In the US, th those arrangements are examined uh, under the Clayton Act and the Hart Scott Rodino Act, but they can be uh, challenged, obviously, uh, if they substantially lessen uh, competition. There is a very uh, active debate in the US, I understand, uh, on, on proposals on how to deal with them. Um, some people just uh, propose basically to refine the antitrust uh, tools, use the modified Herfindel Index, like uh, Elhoek. Uh, to uh, guide decisions like uh, before for mergers we use the Herfindahl Index. Uh, Posner et al. propose limits to ownership in oligopolistic industries um, for investors if they want to benefit from a safe harbor from the enforcement of the Clayton Act. This uh, proposal I certainly I see as somewhat problematic uh, to implement. And there is a debate, um, Rock and Rubenfeld and others have criticized those views and provide uh, potential uh, alternatives. So it's pretty active. In the European uh, Union, so here, uh, the difference, the potential difference is that the, the European Union merger regulation is limited to acquisitions that confer control and therefore is narrower than Section 7 of the uh, Clayton Act, which is lessening uh, competition. Okay? Uh, so um, this, I think, again, is an issue which is debated in the European uh, uh, context. An indication that there is concern, for example, and, and this I quote here, um, is in the recent decision on the um, uh, Dow DuPont merger, it states the Commission is of the view that a number of large agrochemical companies have a significant level of common shareholding, and that too, in the context of innovation competition, such findings provide indications that innovation competition in crop protection should be less intense as compared with an industry with no common shareholding. I'm not sure I agree with this statement, but uh, this at least it mentions uh, that the concern uh, is there. In conclusion, um, so both theory and preliminary evidence point at the potential antitrust concerns with increasing common and overlapping ownership. I think that the empirical work has detected, has to be refined, but has detected something, okay? Um, and has passed already uh, quite a few uh, controls. What does this imply in practice? Well, this, I think, calls for antitrust scrutiny, yes, uh, but it, in my view, it does not call, it's too early to advance and implement major changes, either in regulation or antitrust enforcement. So the, uh, the, um, the tools we have, I think, uh, still, uh, they, are, uh, they are valid. Maybe it's true that uh, antitrust enforcers may start uh, thinking how to use the modified Herfindel index, although there 
they will have to do a lot of work because to do it properly is not easy. That's uh, quite uh, different. Uh, it's quite difficult. Um, it's true that this is an endogenous variable, but the Herfindahl index is also an endogenous variable, and this was already taken uh, into account. And in general, we need to have a better understanding of the channels of transmission of ownership patterns into competitive outcomes via corporate governance, more empirical evidence of consumer harm, if any, and the effects of innovation. But still, uh, I believe that the traditional competition policy controlling market concentration is still valid in a world of overlapping ownership uh, arrangements, and that, yes, we have to think about how to develop tools, uh, but we have to be uh, careful, and in particular, the way uh, in practice the lambdas, so these degrees of internalization are constructed, is very uh, important and is not, is not an easy task. Now, what do I think are key elements to define the policy towards overlapping ownership uh, arrangements? So first, is that the most, so here I think, again, in antitrust we like to think in terms of red, gray, and green areas, okay, so of, uh, of potential, uh, and I think from the point of view of the firms is the same, right, so uh, of potential, like a cartel is a red, uh, no, is, is a red area. And so here uh, I think w what we should uh, start thinking uh, is that the really uh, potential uh, uh, problems are in particular in intra-industry internalization when the shareholders also are not diversified in other industries. So I would say that this is the, the prime area of concern. Okay? So, and then, therefore, to take into account the extent of intra-industry versus inter-industry. Okay? So, for example, um, if you have an industry which is controlled by funds, which are basically, they're industry specific, and they have large stakes in all the firms, okay? So this uh, would be, uh, if I was an antitrust enforcer, I would look at it quite closely, okay? But if, if the funds are very diversified, uh, then you have to be much more careful. Because then you have to balance potential, the uh, anti-competitive effects of the intra-industry versus uh, potential beneficial effects inter-industry. Also, you have to take into account very much the type of uh, links, whether they are silent, so with no control, uh, and then how you measure the degree of control, okay? or whether they are just partial cross-ownership links because they imply uh, different lambdas, if you want, and, and this is what we want to uh, get at. Also, we need to uh, think about the extent of externalities, for example, technological spillovers and how this, uh, and, and the market structure, and how uh, concentrated is the market. And also, to complicate further things, the relative market power in product and labor markets. Okay, so it's not the same uh, situations where we think, um, and industries where we think that the labor market is very competitive uh, to the ones where we uh, suspect that there may be uh, oligopsony or monopsony power in the labor market. And I leave it here. Thank you very much. Pablo. You, uh, ah, yes, yes, you want this. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just get the water okay. out of your way. Trade your waters. Okay. So first of all, thank you very much, Marco, for inviting me. Um, let me go very quickly, because time is limited. Xavier focused on antitrust concerns. Um, however, I'm going to show you, throughout his remarks, he conflates what is called common ownership with what is called cross-ownership by using a new term called overlapping ownership, and they're extremely different. Importantly, he notes in his paper um, that there are potential concerns on the underlying theories which remain both untested and unproven, and I'm going to show you today why these theories, in fact, don't meet even a close sniff test of a real world. So let's jump right in. First thing is, this diagram comes from the OECD, who held a hearing on the topic. And the first thing they thought was important to do was set the record of what is cross-ownership and what is common ownership. Now, interestingly, in the paper that Xavier wrote, he talks about an example with Ryanair acquiring Aer Lingus stock. But that is not common ownership, that is cross-ownership. Throughout all of the literature on common ownership, 
there is conflation of the two. And I think that's got to be the starting point of really studying and understanding this is making sure you're studying the right thing. So there are several papers. Um, I'm happy to see Martin here today, since he's a co-author of all of them. Um, and there are papers on airlines, banking, and executive compensation. Uh, based on some correlations, they came up with these theories about competitive behavior in, in companies and in, in concentrated industries, specifically where institutional investors, a broadly defined term, hold shares in multiple companies. So when Xavier says there is some evidence of, comp uh, of a competition problem and effects on prices and consumers, this is the evidence that he's referring to. Um, however, as I'm going to demonstrate very quickly here, the papers themselves are critically flawed in a number of ways. I'm not alone in my thoughts. Um, today, there is actually a growing body of literature challenging everything from the assumptions, the methodology, and the conclusions of the original papers. Um, since the data has not yet been made available by the authors, it's very difficult to challenge the data and the methodology specifically, um, but we're hoping that they will relent and make that available. So what is this growing body of literature? The authors include academics from the University of Virginia, the University of Chicago, as well as from Columbia Law and NYU Law Schools. One paper is authored by two Federal Reserve economists. And note that the Quan paper that was cited by Xavier as evidence of incentives actually comes to the opposite conclusion of the paper by uh, Mr. Schmaltz, um, on executive compensation, saying, in fact, common ownership leads to better outcomes. The most recent entry in the um, challenge papers, I'll call them, is by Jug Judge Douglas Ginsburg, just released last week, and he is a judge in the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia and is noted for his um, antitrust competitive um, work. There are several others. I won't list them all. But as a whole, what you'll see is each of these papers refute the original findings, and they conclude, in fact, that common ownership does not lead to the anti-competitive behavior. So one of the oddest aspects of this debate is that it's very well known that, in fact, correlation is not the same as causation. So likewise, any normal academic process would begin with data that can be both verified and challenged. Um, but to date, as I mentioned earlier, the details of the data and the methods um, are a secret sauce that has not been released. So while many have been quick to accept those findings and make policy recommendations, we consider that quite premature. So let's start with the data itself. First, there's the data that is reported by asset managers. This data is called threshold reporting. It's a regulatory concept, and it's actually completely unrelated to ownership. So let me give you an example. BlackRock manages money for sovereign wealth funds, for pension plans, for mutual funds, all different holders. Some of those investors actually dictate the voting in their interests. Common ownership theory assumes everything reported under threshold reporting, we actually control the vote. So it's a fallacy right from the beginning. The reporting rules vary by each jurisdiction, but all of them require us to aggregate every dollar of stock, regardless of where it is on our platform, whether it's for an individual client, a mutual fund, et cetera. So it would be impossible from that data to construe anything about ownership in the first place. But let's assume we go forward from there. Almost all of the discussions that I've attended that Martin has presented at, he puts up a comparison of BlackRock and Berkshire Hathaway. So we have also put up a comparison of the same. And you can see Berkshire Hathaway is an asset owner, whereas BlackRock is an asset manager. The boxes on the right highlight some of the very important differences. As an asset owner, Berkshire Hathaway is selecting a small number of companies. In many cases, they are asking for board seats. 
I don't know how they interact with the companies. You'd have to go and ask them. Um, but I do know how BlackRock acts. As an asset manager, we are a fiduciary for those multiple clients that I talked about. We hold minority stakes in, on behalf of those clients in thousands of companies. We don't take board seats on any public companies. And our clients are the ones who bear the economic outcomes of any of the underlying portfolios. So this idea that we have incentive is completely bunk. The idea that we even have opportunity is pretty bunk. So let's stick with airlines, since that was the first paper, and it's the one that is the most cited. I think you'll find it interesting to know that airlines are less than 1% of any of the major indices. So it would be irrational for us, as a holder of all of the companies in the indices, to want to raise airline price, prices for tickets, because all of the other companies in the portfolio would need those tickets and would become an increased expense. Now, Xavier mentioned intra-industry versus inter-industry, and I think he's onto something. If you only own a few companies in one industry and you own nothing else, perhaps there's something there. I'm not going to, I'm not going to say I'm not an economist. But if you own all of the companies in the industry, this is a ridiculous theory because you'd have zero incentive. So let's again stick with airlines for a moment. The period of, of study in the paper was 2001 to 2014. As you can see here, a few other things were going on with these airlines. So United, Delta, and American, each one went through bankruptcy, each one went through a major merger. I don't even know, again, I'm not an economist, but I don't even know how you could control for that in any rational way and come up with data that would be meaningful. In addition, there's a little known rule, goes back to the 1700s in the United States, which limits the carriers in the United States for points A to B, if they're domestic, must be a domestic carrier. So the US government is actually the one limiting competition, not the asset managers. And if that wasn't enough fun, let's look at the airlines and their actual behavior. So this doesn't look like people who don't want to compete. It looks to me like they're pretty cutthroat. Sometimes they're even so cutthroat, they harm themselves and each other. So I'm not sure how they're making us as a manager happy with that if all of the companies go down in value, which seems to happen on a fairly regular basis. Now, Xavier also went through very quickly one of his slides, he talked about entrepreneurial firms. And you know, that's another point that has been made on airlines and other industries that where you have an entrepreneurial firm, they really compete, whereas the others don't. So I looked at the four companies that he mentioned. First is Berkshire Hathaway. So they, Warren Buffett has an 18% ownership, but he has a 32% vote. He obviously dominates the voting. Walmart, between Walmart the family and Walton Enterprises, which sounds to me like Walmart the family, they actually have over 50% of the vote. So I'm not sure what this entrepreneurialism is other than a very um, owner-driven culture with very little governance from a corporate governance perspective. So when you look at data, it's also important to look at what is missing from the data. And clearly, um, just as I'm not an economist, um, the authors are not asset managers because they were not aware of proxy advisory firms. And proxy advisory firms actually control between 15 and 25% of the vote. So that would be a pretty material factor of how people vote and who follows them. Um, in addition, the compensation paper is even more shocking because it doesn't take into account the presence of compensation consultants. 
And anybody who deals with boards knows that the compensation committee hires one of these firms. They do a competitive analysis. They say, my CEO, of course, is the best, so it has to be in the top 10 or 25%. I can't be worse than the others. And compensation continues to march up. Asset managers, on the other hand, have an occasional say on pay vote after the fact, non-binding. OK, so since this is um, about corporate governance, I thought it's interesting to see over the past couple of decades, there's been a tremendous amount of effort by people like yourselves on corporate governance. There are now over 17 stewardship codes in jurisdictions around the world. Um, and I'm going to defer to Greg here, because the OECD um, published theirs in 1999. And he, I'm sure we'll talk about that. So as time is running short, um, I'm going to leave the policy proposals and, and measures to another time. We do it in Q&A. Um, but actually, I think it's way premature to even consider any kind of policy measures, because the theories themselves, when you test them, they just don't hold any water. Uh, suffice it to say that we believe these theories are not well supported. Um, hopefully, I've introduced some real world data and given you something to think about. And I'll say, Xavier noted in his article that it's early to advance changes in regulation. And we could not agree more. Uh, there are many reasons to doubt the real world relevance of these theories and many reasons to pause before entertaining any kind of policy measures. Thank you very much. Very good. Uh, well, look, uh, thank you, uh, Marco, and uh, Xavier, thank you for your comments, and uh, Barbara. Uh, can you all hear me OK? It's a bit of an echo there. But, uh, well, basically, the, uh, um, I thought the presentation from uh, Professor Vives was, was very interesting and actually raises a lot of issues that also I'm going to comment on uh, that we've been looking at at the OECD. Uh, and as was mentioned in the introduction, uh, the directorate uh, that I head up is, uh, includes both competition and corporate governance. And... Uh, I guess corporate governance is something I do know, having been chairman of the Australian Securities Commission uh, for at least seven years and chairman of IOSCO uh, for about four years. So it is an interesting topic. Uh, but I guess I've also seen corporate governance in the real world as a regulator. So today I want to cover three things. One is really just to sort of paint the broad context of the discussion in terms of uh, and corporate ownership at the company level. And then to address the two issues, which is the implications of common ownership uh, for corporate governance and then the implications for competition. So if we look uh, first of all at um, the context, um, you know, ownership structures are closely linked to the structure and functioning of capital markets. And you know, clearly I think, uh, as Professor Vess said, last few years, market structures changed um, in publicly uh, traded markets. And it's, it's clearly a fact that uh, in many markets, developed markets, uh, you've got a growing dominance of institutional shareholders. Um, and also, uh, at the same time, you've got not just across the world, uh, you've actually got an increasing concentration um, of ownership. And I think that has led to an increased concentration um, of ownership by institutional investors. So if you just have a look at this issue of uh, um, dominance, you know, it's been really driven by the shift in savings and investment patterns away from uh, retail and household investors towards institutional um, and intermediary investors in major jurisdictions. Uh, and institutional invest ownership in most advanced markets uh, is obviously growing uh, in importance and often for good reasons because retail investors find it a lot easier, a lot more liquid. Uh, and it's pretty well clear from, as you can see on that table, uh, the shift is most pronounced in the United States, United Kingdom and Canada, where the institutional ownership of large listed companies at the end of 16 was 73%, uh, 66%, 
and 48% respectively. They look at uh, the issue of um, at the company level, uh, that shift, we also know uh, that, that, that it does have a, an impact on, um, you know, on public policy um, in areas such as uh, good corporate governance, uh, capital market development, as I said, and competition. So uh, it's quite, uh, quite a big uh, uh, impact. So and not only it's about who owns uh, the company, but also the degree of ownership uh, or control, so which is quite uh, quite critical. So, and there has obviously, I think, as was raised earlier, I mean, the uh, much of the corporate governance debate uh, in the past, we you know, sort of fundamental theory in public listed companies was separation of management and control. I think what's pretty clear these days is that um, that doesn't really uh, 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 you know, exist a lot of the time, but basically. Um, you know, we, that concentration we see around the world, uh, as you can see from this uh, graph, uh, that for various reasons uh, you've actually got concentrations of, of ownership, uh, whether it be, uh, you know, large family corporations, whether it may in some cases be uh, state-owned enterprises that are owned by governments or major markets, uh, institutions. So... Um, the, uh, I think that's pretty clear from uh, from this particular uh, graph. I mean, the uh, what we see is uh, from this graph is that in um, you know as was, you can see at the bottom there the uh, the impact of in R Indonesia, Russia, and Turkey that uh, basically you've got a, a dominance of, of family companies. So if we look at the concentration of ownership in the hands of institutional investors. Uh, uh, it doesn't mean that, uh, that these markets that have the least concentration of ownership correspond to the, I guess, the normal diversified that we mentioned. As I said, in the largest US listed companies, for example, the 10 largest institutional holders uh, on average hold about 30% of listed companies' uh, capital. And as was, you can see from there, uh, the United States, uh, UK, Canada and Poland uh, and South Africa and Japan, the largest 10 institutional holders hold between 13 and 22% of capital. And some of the drivers behind the development, again, increasing um, assets under management by institutional holders uh, has increased uh, and institutional investors' portfolio allocation. Uh, so obviously the amount of assets gone up and also at the same time institutional investors' uh, share of that has gone up uh, faster than the number of new companies. So, and as you all know, there has been a huge surge in the last um, you know, um, 20 years or more of funds under management, increased by 500% in the last two decades. So... What does this actually mean for, for corporate governance? Well, overall, uh, institutional owners obviously are the largest category of publicly equity owners in U US, UK and Canada, uh, and they do hold between a half and three quarters of the capital. Uh, as I said, they are the largest institutional investors, uh, single category owner in many countries. Uh, and what does it mean for corporate governance? Well, I think it actually means that uh, you know, we we can't. I think we need to actually think about you know what it's in, you know, what the nature of the company is and what has been mentioned, what the nature of the business model is, what the nature of the incentives are for management, and what the investment strategies of the un individual uh, institutional holder are, whether they're passive or active, has been discussed. But I think the shift to in institutional ownership. Um, obviously uh, has inspired several regulatory and voluntary initiatives aimed at increasing. What we want actually is, you know, the, the issue I guess for institutional investors is, you know, they are growing in importance. And on one hand, we've got the discussion here today about them perhaps having undue influence, but equally, uh, many people want them to be actively engaged. Uh, they want them to actually uh, vote and participate in company uh, meetings. So, uh, and as uh, Barbara mentioned, uh, we've got 
you know, the list uh, of stewardship codes for institutional investors, encouraging them to be uh, responsible and actually, uh, uh, you know, engage in effective uh, uh, engagement by, uh, with their companies. So uh, I think what's important, we want them, uh, I think, you know, if we're going to have effective uh, shareholder engagement, I think that we want them to engage uh, with the voting. We don't want them necessarily to, to tick the box, uh, and which is, frankly, I know from my uh, role as a, a market regulator, what we really don't... The big issue that Barbara raised is it has been something of concern to market regulators, which is proxy advisors, where often uh, they don't have uh, adequate data, they don't have adequate resources, and sometimes their uh, voting recommendations are could be, you know, not initially rational in terms of uh, uh, the voting that's recommended. So that is an area of concern. So we want them to engage. We don't want them to take a, uh, a box-ticking approach. Uh, and I think if you've got a truly informed shareholder engagement uh, in an institution's investment model, I think um, it actually is really quite important in acting responsibly. So... And, in the latest chapter of the uh, G20 OECD principles on corporate governance, we've actually got a whole chapter that actually looks at the issue of uh, institutional investors uh, and engagement. Uh, so, but what's very clear, uh, as has been said today, you know, the increasing popularity of passive uh, investment in capital markets uh, is lifting the importance of uh, institutional investors, particularly passive ones. Um, as I said, the investment in exchange-traded funds is growing fast. Asset managers, uh, you know, are adopting passive strategies, generally because it's what investors want. <laughs> they, they actually, this is what they want, that they, they provide low cost, uh, low tracking error, they give diversity, they give liquidity. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, they are a fact of life and, and I think for many investors, very attractive. So, uh, but at the same time, you know, I think ownership engagement uh, is quite important, uh, whether you're, you know, passive or active, and that it, but it's got to be uh, responsible. And one of the problems at times is that the um, passive managers uh, may not want to invest in being active because they consider it a cost and they're very low cost. So, again, it's another potentially, uh, you know, dual personality, right, that uh, they're trying to be low cost, therefore they don't want to invest in it. But equally, if the system's going to work properly, actually, and they hold, if they do hold large amounts, we want to make sure that they hold boards to accountable and to be responsible. So, uh, in terms of the uh, implications for uh, competition... Well, I think as really it's been said today that uh, in uh, Professor Viva's paper, uh, the effect on competition uh, when rival businesses have shareholders in common, it has been a, a lively debate. Uh, the competition concern boils down to this. If businesses observe they have uh, large institutional shareholders in common, they may, they may make decisions that reflect specific interests of those shareholders and they may compete less aggressively than they would otherwise. They may. So if you, you know, and I think that, uh, you know, to give three examples of the concerns, I think, you know, management may have, for example, uh, as Barbara said, the uh, remuneration report in many countries, the pay on say, uh, it's non-binding. However, in countries like Australia, uh, that non-binding vote, it, we have a three structure out rule. So uh, you potentially can impact on uh, remuneration if on the third time because it results in a, a spill of the whole board. So uh, it, it is potentially a risk uh, in that if uh, management concerned about its uh, remuneration report uh, getting, you know, rejected for some reason, it could happen. It could. So, I, you know, it is, again, I think the whole thing of this is... is a, you can't discount it as a risk. Is it a remote risk? Is it a present risk? I think that's where, to me, the debate is. And it's clearly, there's, <laughs> there's a risk that certainly, from what I've seen, hasn't crystallised. So management incentives, I think, uh, you know, on pay packages is, is, could be an area. Um, I think there's also, obviously, a potential herding behaviour amongst managers of companies uh, with common major shareholders. 
potentially that's a risk. Um, uh, you know, that then there's the risk, which I think uh, that's potentially a legal issue, is where you have investors in multiple business perhaps pushing companies in those businesses not to compressively uh, uh, compete. I think that's more it would be an issue where you have uh, active investors than a passive investor, frankly, and I think that well, that's clearly a legal issue. So, um, and I think today, I think that, uh, as Barbara outlined, um, you know, the theory is clearly, there's a debate, right? There's a, there's a, there is clearly something to think about as a risk. Um, and I think the debate um, on common ownership uh, is interesting. One of the aspects of Professor Vivas' paper, the impacts on research and development, the spillovers, I think it's an interesting uh, um, aspect to the discussion. I think the findings of his paper, uh, I think just reflect well on um, the current state of debate on ownership. And I think, you know, to, to that, it does depend on four things, right? Uh, it depends. So, first of all, the extent of common ownership links within a, a firm's capital structure. Uh, obviously, really importantly, is that the level of market concentration and therefore power, as, as Professor Vives pointed out. Uh, thirdly, uh, you might have those two factors, but thirdly, it depends on the firm's managers, whether they really, uh, you know, whether that is their, their behaviour. And then uh, fourthly was the point, as uh, Professor Vives pointed out, whether you can point to uh, technology uh, spillovers. So I think, as a result, I think the degree to which common ownership is leading to competition harm today is actually very much open to question. I think uh, clearly competition authorities uh, don't have clear evidence that supports an automatic presumption of cons competition concerns. And I think it's premature, obviously, very premature, to consider any major legislative changes to competition laws to address the common ownership problem uh, as has been proposed by some. However, uh, that doesn't mean that competition authorities shouldn't ignore the research or the risks. Uh, I think, uh, I think it, it, it is interesting because, you know, basically the world's changed, the market structure has changed. We should be thinking about whether there is some unintended consequence that comes out of that. Uh, we've already seen uh, several competition authorities, including the European Commission, uh, look at ownership ties during the merger review process. Uh, the European Commissioner for Competition, uh, Margaret uh, Vestager, uh, has specifically pointed to common ownership as an emerging area of interest. Uh, and I think what's important that businesses um, should be aware that competition authorities and even market regulators um, have the issue on their radar. Uh, and I don't think it's going to go away. It's forums like this that are talking about it. Uh, I think that, uh, again, I think it's a function of a change in market structure. Uh, but also, I think that it's important that, you know, regulators uh, do have tools, as pointed out, at their disposal to evaluate whether common ownership generates competitive harm in a market and to be able to tell actually where, when it does depend. Uh, and I think three tools of particular importance uh, for regulators are including uh, common uh, ownership uh, in the issues they look at in, um, uh, in market studies and also uh, watching, I think, uh, industry-wide concentrations that uh, um, when they're looking at mergers, such as uh, in the... Uh, uh, European uh, Union uh, did with the Dow DuPont merger and I think uh, also collaborating with researchers to better understand the I think empirical findings and as point pointed out today we've had many people academics doing research on this and there there is a debate going on and somewhere in the middle I guess uh, there will be a uh, or well, they may not be a consensual view but I think what we need to do is to listen and discuss it so uh, I think to uh, uh, sum up, I think competition authorities uh, do need to better understand uh, common ownership uh, risks, uh, uh, understand them and, you know, where they see the... Uh, look at the criteria that I mentioned and be just making sure that uh, there is no issue. I think it's important, though, equally for um, the institutional investors... Uh, to be aware of the risk. So 
regulators should be aware of the risk, that equally large institutional investors can't ignore or should be blind to the risk. Uh, you know, I think you do need to take care uh, that there isn't an issue, right? If you do, if you do, if you are a significant shareholder, um, as we know from any corporate governance, uh, having if you're a large organisation, making sure that that's not happening in your organisation is really important. So I think this is to me in some ways a positive because I think it sort of signals something that institutional investors should be aware of that, you know, they've got to be cognizant of it um, and make sure that, you know, there's, there isn't any sort of, uh, um, act, you know, that they're not engaging un even unexpectedly in any activities that, that could facilitate collusion between competing businesses in their portfolio. And I think finally, I think there is a need for a continual dialogue uh, between competition researchers and the investment committee, community to uh, better understand the nature of the influence in corporate governance. And I think today's event, uh, I think, you know, this, things like this are really good for having that forum for discussion and debate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Greg. I think you just reminded us that we have a real dilemma here. On the one hand, we've been asking for more stewardship, and we saw the list of stewardship coming from Barbara. Uh, now, of course, we also heard that the best defense against antitrust problems uh, stemming from that is not to do any stewardship. So we have a real um, uh, public policy dilemma, which I think you brought out, and also the other panelists very well. So um, I'd like, now, like to open to the floor. I'm sure there are many questions that you have to ask or remarks to make. Peter. Peter Montagna. Um, thank you very much. Peter Montagnon from the Institute of Business Ethics in the UK. Um, I'd like to put a little bit of real world experience into this, albeit from uh, a little while ago when I was working uh, with investors and with the FRC on the creation of the stewardship code. And I would freely admit that one of the reasons we wanted to have a stewardship code was to bring shareholders together to influence companies. Mm. Um, because we just felt that if you didn't have a critical mass of ownership working together, you would never be able to mm. actually achieve mm. the government's objective. And that was why we founded the Investor Forum in the UK. Um, but I want to be absolutely clear that nobody at all during that process was trying to do this in order to push the companies mm. into um, positions of market dominance. It was all about detecting and addressing risk before there was a loss of value to the beneficiaries. And those two are completely different things. And where investors do come together, in my experience, it's almost never... It never on the basis mm. of trying to persuade companies to gouge the market mm. and pay them bigger dividends. It's all about uh, limiting risk. And I, uh, that said, I, I did agree with almost everything Barbara said, but I don't think you should be let off the hook that easily because it's not true that all your clients decide how they want you to vote the shares that you hold on their behalf. You've got lots which you vote where you make the decisions and where you actually are in your index funds, as you often will be, on both sides of a takeover. I'm really interested how you apply, if you like, ethical judgment to deciding what to do about that, because it must occur quite often. And that's where I think some of the sort of issues or suspicions that are being raised around this um, may hold a bit of water, um, but I'd like to know what you do. Thank you. Shall I? Yeah, uh, well, thank you for your, your question and, and your comments. Um, first of all, to put it in perspective, we have a 30-person stewardship team, um, and our thought is... Um, along the lines of what Greg said, better to have an informed shareholder to vote than simply follow the advice of a proxy advisory firm, which just concentrates the power even more in those firms. And we could have a separate discussion about how the quality um, of their advice and, and how good is it and um, how, how much it's followed. You would think it's very robust. It, it's not that robust. Um, in terms of mergers, there's not, I mean, you think it happens all the time. It's actually unusual when it comes to a shareholder vote. So many of those are worked out between managements 
in an, I'll say, an amicable way, that the number of contentious votes is very, very small. Where there is a contentious situation, we meet with both sides. Hmm. And we listen, and we do our own analysis, and we decide what we think is right um, from a fiduciary perspective on behalf of our shareholders. Now, in terms of, of how many we vote versus you know, using our guidelines versus someone else, it's a very um, difficult to answer question because it changes over time. Different clients, their valuation changes over time. Um, so to give you a hard number would be almost impossible. But I think the very fact that some of our institutional clients do either vote for themselves or give us their voting guidelines to use and vote on their behalf would challenge the underlying data that's being used in the common ownership studies because it can't possibly be right. David, yes. I have a question, um, which is about... Microphone, please. Yeah, microphone. Thanks. Thanks, Mary. So if we go back to, to Javier's paper, uh, Professor Vivas's paper, um, and the contrast, where we call it that, of Barbara's commentary on it, um, it's clear there's a difference of view. Um, but at the same time, if you read um, the press, you can certainly see there's a lot of concern around the issue, a political concern in particular. So my question is directed towards where this debate might unfold. And I'd be interested in the comments of both you and of Barbara and indeed Greg on this, because it seems to me that you can't put a lid on it and say it's going to disappear. Politically, it's nearly out of the bag. I mean, as an example, not quite in the same point, but the habit of some of the very big tech companies to buy out emerging competitors at fancy valuations very early on is a, you know, another twist on this, if I may put it that way. Um, so it seems to me that there is, um, th there is a debate. So what is the next stage of this debate academically on the one side and if anybody feels like playing with the politics in the public discourse on the other side as well as the academic side? And I, so, I don't mean to set professors at each other's throats either. So yeah, I think this is for you and for sure. you. Mm. Um, I was going to say this is an easy question. Um, uh, it's not. The, um, so I think the debate will continue, both definitely in, on academic terms, uh, among other things, because academics will love to debate, okay? <laughs> so more papers. Um, I, I am a theorist, and so in a sense, for me, debate is a little bit different because theoretical models are always right. Maybe the assumptions are wrong, <laughs> but the, the models are right. So then the empirical work always can be updated, okay? Um, but that's my perspective. Uh, this will continue, uh, and I think that there are grounds for it to continue and, has, and we'll have to distill. Maybe in five years we'll see what results uh, have been proven really robust and what others maybe are not. And we'll know much more, I am sure. On the public debate, this is very complex. Um, and I may go back, for example, to uh, FDR, to, to Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Uh, he, um, uh, he taxed uh, pyramidal schemes in the US to break trusts. Okay, so this gave rise, in fact, to all this uh, institutional investment, in a sense. Okay, and now uh, we are going back to this debate uh, fearing no, that, the, uh, that the institutional investors may have too much power. Um, uh, so here, um, we may, there, this may be linked a little bit also to uh, uh, the post-crisis populism in the sense that uh, the power of big firms is looked at a lot of suspicion. Okay, so this was like in the late 19th century. And there is something of that. Okay, there is something of that. And obviously, this is in the press. And, uh, and, and so this, uh, I think we have to be careful and, and we have to be very kind of uh, think very clearly about the economic incentives no, and the social welfare no, uh, uh, in, the, in, in, in this perspective. But the debate is here to stay for good reasons. Um, l l let me just add something on the dilemma you have uh, posed, um, which in a sense uh, is what I would do if I were BlackRock. Okay, so, but you don't have to take my advice. So you're I listening carefully, Bill? Okay. I'm taking notes. <laughs> I, I, okay. I, uh, so the tension is, cl is, is clear, 
uh, because in this context, at the same time, you are asked to be actively engaged because you are a significant shareholder. And on the other side, okay, careful because depending on what you do, no, uh, this will be wrong. Okay. Uh, so I think that the way uh, some firms have resolved uh, this tension, uh, and for example, uh, this was in another context, uh, this was done by Intel. Um, so the, for many years, Intel had no antitrust problem. Why? Because, uh, first, they were very careful with antitrust, and they had a, a very strong internal compliance program, competition program, internal. And, and the contrast was Microsoft, which got into trouble after trouble. Okay? So uh, what I would do uh, is I would keep active engagement, so I would follow the stewardship you know, uh, idea so that, that the significant shareholder has to be actively engaged, uh, uh, this will be, if done right, a positive force for corporate governance. But at the same time, I would start uh, an internal uh, compliance com competition problem, uh, a program, sorry, uh, to, um, to, be, to be very careful that in all those instances where uh, this intra-industry uh, uh, internalization may be anti-competitive, you are alert to that. Okay? So th this is what we do. Yeah. May I? Oh. Oh, so, um, you want to respond? To uh, yes. So we are totally aware of the internal compliance issues and, and think about those regularly. I think one of the things that's not particularly well um, advertised is as a result of these papers, the Department of Justice actually did a study of the airlines mm. and they found no issue. So um, I'm not sure what to say other than the authors themselves say, they find these correlations, but they don't find causation. The Department of Justice looked into it. They don't find collusion. Um, so I would go back to an academic debate is interesting, but somehow this debate um, never occurred um, from the release of the very first paper. There was a sensational media campaign um, television as well as me, you know, written media right out of the gate of a paper that has yet to be peer reviewed or published. And it's now three years later, data's not available and it has taken on a life of its own. I think there's an academic issue with that. Hmm. But Can I just comment? Right. I, I think here, uh, I think two issues from a, a law enforcement perspective. Uh, I think that to me, this is one of those risks that law enforcement, you should always be identifying emerging risks. Uh, this is to me in the category of emerging risks. Hopefully it is emerging. And I think, so I think that's why it is on the radar. Um, and I think that, as I said, I think that uh, market reg uh, you know, competition regulators, you know, will, when appropriate, be looking at it in terms of market studies or, or when they're looking at mergers. It, you know, it's a to me, it's very analogous to when I was a securities regulator, and and Haber and I know very well uh, where the Financial Stability Board said funds are of systemic risk. They're too big. They're they're not. They're like you know, they're banks. Well, they like banks. And therefore, we've got to be scared. And uh, we went through several years of tr explaining funds management is very different to running a bank. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think it's just, to me, a, an outcome, I think, of ETFs in particular being so successful that they've become too big to ignore. Um, and they've become too big to ignore and they, they didn't classify it as systemically important. Uh, but, again, here, I think they are too, it's too big to ignore Therefore, I think you need to at least consider the aspect of what you're talking about. And I do agree at the company level. Uh, so, obviously, if you know your regulator is going to be concerned about it, then, you know, their concern is now your concern. So, as a company, and uh, so I think clearly what uh, Barbara is saying in terms of compliance is, or you were saying, but in terms of it, knowing that if it could be a risk, making sure that you've got good risk management in place, which includes thinking about compliance or red flags to identify where you perhaps need to look at it more. Because the last thing that somebody like a big fund manager would want is if it does eventuate, because it really affects their reputation, right? And reputation risk is number one. So, I, you know, I do think there's a dual thing there, I think, uh, you know, if it does, you don't want it to crystallise, and neither does a market regulator. 
Yeah, please say it. I, I also want to say something. Yeah. Yeah. Go on. Yeah, just this, my experience, such as it is, not in this field, but in another one, is that you have your list of emerging risks all right, and you know that subject X is bubbling away over there, and here we have unanimity, if not about anything else, that it's premature to act. But the problem with emerging risks is that some politician or other suddenly sees a problem to which acting on this is a solution. And mm. then you're into, you know, God knows what will happen next, and it becomes fashionable to do something. So I think this is a big yeah, issue. Yeah, for yeah. If everybody's agree that it's premature, um, emerging risks and good risk management is all very well, but the next thing, you have an actual live... Well, that, that's why uh, if you've got a good market regulator, they actually say to the policymaker, there's no issue. <laughs> well, if I'm just, Jack, I'll give you the word in a second. One second, I just want to say something on the data issue. So um, on the data... Uh, researchers are reluctant to make their data available before publication uh, because they want to publish and there are others and so forth, and they've invested in data sets. Now, when a paper is published, most of the leading journals actually require the researchers to make the data available so that other researchers or other concerned parties mm. can check and, you know, the, the, the results must be replicable. They even ask you to um, submit source code of wow. statistics programs and so forth. This is now a standard. I would be surprised since the Journal of Finance is by the American Finance Association and they are really the gold standard in the world on this if that was not to be made available. But, you know, I don't want to put Martin on the spot and what you know, they'll do if he's here. Um, but, you know, uh, I mean, certainly that's the scholarly standard and that's to be expected. Um, That's the standard, yeah, I agree. That, uh, you agree, so yeah, right? Right, but Absolutely. the assumption would also be the academic debate is held before the political debate, but we haven't gone in that order. Well, we can debate uh, academic incentives, peer yeah. review. Um, unfortunately, the truth is that if you have three competing teams, uh, only the lab that gets into the journal first wins. Uh, you know that, but we can debate the we can debate you know that aspect of publishing. The change, the change is that years ago this was not like this because Twitter did not exist, right? Huh. And now it's, we're in it's the a world debate world also about goes much faster. So the debates go much faster now. I mean, it's a debate like about the debate about pre-published work, it's, it's and today um, pre-published work uh, is becoming more exactly. important, more impactful more debated, et cetera. And it's, it's a real issue which also ECGI is trying to address in a variety of ways. Right. But it's, it's extremely challenge. dangerous. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It has pros and cons. No it has pros and cons, yes. Pros and cons. Jack. If I could move us back from academic politics to current events, <laughs> I want to give us an example that I think brings these issues down to contemporary current events. Hmm. And I'm going to ask Barbara to respond to it. The idea that consensus among institutional investors uh, proves collusion is subject to some counterexamples. And the most recent counterexample is about 10 days old in the United States because the Trump administration, through its Department of Labor, has indicated that funds that invest in environmental, social, and governance issues may not be qualified trustees under ERISA. They are suggesting that if you pursue environmental, social, governance issues, ESG in shorthand, you are deviating from profit maximization and breaching your fiduciary duties. Wow. That has created instantly a firestorm in which every institutional investor that I'm aware of is joining an angry food fight telling the Department of Labor that they are unwise and going against history. But that's total consensus, and I could see how an academic researcher could see total consensus that indicates collusion. But maybe it doesn't. Maybe <laughs> it just means you can't believe what the heck they're saying down there in Washington. Hmm. Now, this is a very hot debate in the U.S., and Barbara, I'm sure you're involved in it because actually your fund is probably better known than most for its commitment to ESG issues. Hmm. So, any comment? Okay, so I wear two hats at BlackRock. Um, one is public policy and one is investment stewardship. And this is an example of where my two worlds very clearly come together. Um, I would say our reading of the Department of Labor statement um, is a little bit less extreme than what you described. What they say is you shouldn't be using ESG as 
the reason for investing one way or another, but they don't say you can't engage in ESG, and in the case of us, you know, how we go about our, our engagement is not intended, um, I, I would say it's intended to maximize value, right? It's, it's not intended to be ESG alone. We're not pursuing social goals. We're not becoming a social, I, say, I, say, I use the term social justice warriors. Like, that's not what we do, but we are concerned about the value of the companies and protecting the downside as well as you know, improving governance, which we think long-term improves value. Now in terms of, well, um, so in ter that's the second half. So in terms of who is lobbying the DOL one way or another, we're actually not. Um, we don't think this ruling is as big as you think. Um, this is one where there's, I'll say there's a pendulum, but it doesn't swing so far right or so far left. Under the Obama administration, they had also put something out saying you can consider ESG, but it was within the confines of um, long-term performance. So you see this pendulum, I'll say, wiggling as opposed to swinging, mm. and each administration putting its political spin on it. But there is legislation of ERISA that sets the bounds. And the Department of Labor can only move within a fairly narrow tolerance. So I, I think it's going to have less impact than you think. Um, but it does make people s step back and say, are we doing things that are for social justice? Like there's one manager, um, an activist manager, who holds himself out as looking at social justice causes. Like mm -hmm. that's their thing. It's not about the company. It's about getting companies to be mm -hmm. better in social justice. You know, that would be a problem under ERISA. So ERISA, so people know, ERISA covers corporate pension plans, including defined benefit mm -hmm. and defined contribution. It does not include um, foundations, endowments, sovereign wealth funds. It doesn't include anything outside the United States. And very importantly, it doesn't include a lot of public funds. Mm -hmm. So state of California, state of wherever. Many public funds choose, voluntarily choose, to abide by ERISA, but that is their choice. Um, some do, some don't, and I, I don't have the list. Mm -hmm. So what you're seeing in terms of lobbying is... Um, if there's a right and left in the U.S., which there appears to be, uh, the left is clearly upset that the right has just turned over what the left did a few years ago. And for all I know, um, the next round, that pendulum will wiggle back to the other side. But I, I wouldn't read as much into it. Other questions? Okay, I think people want their coffee break. So thank you very much, uh, Xavier. Thank you very much, Barbara. Uh, Greg. Thank you. Uh, from what I heard, this was not the last debate we've had on the topic, but I hope that the tension will be resolved in the sense of no antitrust concerns and lots of stewardship. Thank you. Thank you.